Um, technology 10, Christians 0, but I think we have the uh, sound working now. Uh, let me uh, welcome you here, and it's my great privilege and my great pleasure uh, to welcome Kenneth, Kenneth Carroll uh, here as well. Uh, he will say more about this. Canon Karen is the General Secretary of the Anglican Consultant of Communion, which is, uh, I like to say, it's the Archbishop of Canterbury's vestry, but that's sort of a, a layman's analogy. It's, uh, it's the arm, the day-to-day the -day arm of the Anglican Communion, a very important uh, piece of who we are, and especially in today's world. So I am going to turn this over to Canon. We will welcome you. First of all, Dean, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I've been here for the last, uh, say it came on Thursday. What is something wrong here? Just keep going. Keep going, I'll take you in just a minute. Okay. okay. Um, I've been... Just keep going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not being very successful at this. You need to lower it a bit somehow. Yeah? Okay? Yeah. Okay. A chance that I don't have you deaf by the time I finish. Okay, I've been here since Thursday. Um, we are meeting up. What are they doing down there? You, will I just take it off and shout? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the best thing to do. You okay? No, I'll we'll be okay. I think they're saying it's okay now. Okay? Right. Let's see. And then I'll take it off. And I've been here since Thursday at a body called the Compass Rose Society. Uh, we've been meeting for Friday and Saturday uh, here in your diocesan office. That's an international body bringing people from around the communion who are supportive of the communion. But I'm not here to talk about that uh, today. I want to talk a little bit about the Anglican communion, which is my sort of full-time job. So you already guessed from my accent already, uh, I'm not from the US. <laughs> um, I'm actually from Ireland, and you could have guessed that as well. Um, and I've been in this job for about seven years. So I'm a member of the Church of Ireland, uh, a very small church, uh, but one of the very ancient churches of uh, the Anglican Communion. I, I want to talk a little bit about the Anglican Communion, and I don't want to talk about the history, because that's what people often do. But I want to just outline the history and then talk about what it's like today. Uh, and the way we see it, which I think gives some sort of perspective on the way it is. As you know, the Anglican Communion, uh, Anglicanism, arose out of the churches in the British Isles, England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales. And in particular, and all of those are very, very ancient churches. Uh, the Church of England dates itself to 570 something, the Church of Ireland to 432, Wales, and so on. So, really, very ancient churches. And what was very formative of them was the way in which they went through the Reformation. They aren't churches that began with the Reformation. They went through the Reformation and reformed at that time. Then, uh, particularly for political reasons, they, were, they spread with the Church of England with the spread of the British Empire. And one of the first spreads of the British Empire, as you well know, was over in this direction. And uh, because of the American Revolution, there was a fairly serious split between the Church of England and what we now know as the Episcopal Church for historical reasons. And the communion continued on, uh, what we now call the communion, continued on with the spread of the British Empire and effectively going first of all as chaplaincies, then as missionary situations, and then forming churches. <coughs> Meanwhile, the American part, the Episcopal Church, also had its missionary expansion as well. So that by the 19th century, you actually had the beginnings of a fairly global church tracing itself in two different ways. One back to the churches of the British Isles, and one tracking itself through the Episcopal Church, and through that back into the Church of England. So, you have uh, a, a communion that's beginning to evolve. It hasn't been without controversy, to say the least. But the first major controversy for that global church was in South Africa in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, there was a row between the Bishop, Archbishop of Cape Town and the Bishop of Natal in South Africa. Natal is up near Durban, that sort of area in South Africa. There was a row about the Old Testament, so it was a fairly esoteric row, but it got serious. And eventually the Archbishop of Cape Town decided to depose 
the Bishop of Natal. Uh, the Bishop of Natal replied with his lawyers and said, you have no right to do that to me. I was consecrated by the Archbishop of Canterbury. You are consecrated by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Only he could do that. So both of them appealed to the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time, in the 1860s, who had absolutely no idea what to do. <laughs> so the only thing someone advised them to say, listen, gather all of the bishops whom you are in communion with for advice, and maybe they can help you find the way forward. And that's what he did. And he called them all together, there's about 70 of all, from around the world, from the Episcopal Church and so on, to the Lam to Lambeth Palace for the first Lambeth Conference. Uh, and the body was to advise him, not to tell him what to do. It wasn't an authoritative body, but to give the Archbishop of Canterbury advice. And that tradition has continued to gather the Archbishop of Canterbury, now every 10 years, gathers all of the bishops with whom he is in communion. It's quite important, with whom he's in communion. Two Lambeth are nowadays to Canterbury, the University of Canterbury, for a conference, the Lambeth Conference. It's the beginnings of what we now know as the Anglican Communion. Um, and the, the significance of an invitation to your bishop to the Lambeth Conference is very significant for your membership of the Anglican Communion. Move on, and they meet here roughly every 10 years uh, as bishops. That's the only thing that's holding the thing together. In the mid 60s, uh, with various churches becoming autonomous, and the British Empire ceasing, particularly in Africa, we get a lot of autonomous churches setting up their own structures. Same thing is happening with the churches spawned by the Episcopal Church, beginning to become independent, beginning to become autonomous, and all of them have synodical structures. And they're beginning to say, hang on. Communion can't be run by a group of bishops. We need lay people and clergy involved. So in 1968, they decided to set up the Anglican Consultative Council. Uh, and that is composed of lay people, clergy, and bishops from each of the churches of the Anglican Communion. And nowadays, there are 38 autonomous churches around the communion. The Church of Japan, the Episcopal Church, the Canadian Church, Ireland, England, Scotland, Wales, South Africa, Tanzania, you know, Congo, and so on, 38. Uh, in 1978, and that body meets every three years. In 1978, the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time said, I need some regular support from my fellow colleagues. And my colleagues are the primates, the heads of all of these autonomous churches. And he, as the head of the Church of England, invites the heads of all of the other churches for consultation. And it happens about every two. That's the primates meeting. So then you begin to have a communion. You say you have, first of all, a body which is in communion with the Archbishop of Canterbury, whose bishop, your bishop, is invited to the Lamb of Conference. You elect, your church elects people, clergy, laity, and bishops to the Anglican Consultative Council, and your primate is invited to the primates meeting. That's the area that define what it is to be an Anglican, part of the Anglican. My job is to be the secretary and executive officer of each one of those instruments, the Lambeth Conference, the ACC, and the Primates Meeting. And also have a separate role, which is to represent the different parts of the communion to one another, and explain what's going on, and to listen to what's happening. So for example, on a visit like this, and this isn't a big visit for me, but a visit like this, I am listening to what's happening in this church, and I reflect back the issues and concerns that I've heard, and I've been meeting your bishop a lot over the last few days. Things he's saying that are important to him and so on, I reflect that back. And I next I go to Brazil in a few weeks' time, I reflect what's happening in Brazil, and gradually begin to identify common themes that are happening in the conference. So today, Anglicanism is what we call a reformed Catholic tradition. By Catholic, we mean we find our roots in the early church. And we also say that the insights of the early church, as it began to shape itself, I find identity. First, second, third centuries, first of all, of the, uh, the, the disciples, the apostles, but also the early church. They had certain insights into the way the church should be organized that we believe are part of the good way in which the church is organized. So, for example, the creeds come from that period and our use of the creeds dates right back to that period. Um, the basic shape of our liturgy, our communion service, actually has its roots in the early centuries of the church. 
The notion of having a church with bishops, priests, and deacons dates right back to that period. A distinctive role for bishops in terms of ordering the life of the church in a particular diocese. All of those things come from those early periods of the church. Placing worship at the Eucharist at the very heart of our regular worship was something the early church did, but we do it today. Now we don't claim that we do it right and everyone else does it wrong. Lots of different ways of doing organizing a church. But by claiming to be a Catholic church, we are claiming that the insights of the early church into the way they organize themselves are relevant and important to us. We're also a reformed church, not a church founded at the Reformation, but we came to through the Reformation. And we want to claim that the insights of the Reformation are also very, very important for our life. For example, placing the Bible at the heart of everything we do, it was a Reformation insight. And we try to do that as Anglicans today. Seeing the body, the, sorry, seeing the church as not just the body of Christ, but also as the people of God, and holding those two parts in tension, the body of Christ, and the people of God. That's the church. And holding those two is a very important principle of the Reformation. And today, that phrase, people of God, means that we believe that everyone in the church has a say in the life and the running of the church. That's easiest expressed through your local council, vestries, and so on, your diocesan convention, synod, councils, your national general convention, or general synod in some churches, and so on. Clergy, lay people, and bishops meeting together for the common good of the church. And that was an important reformation also placing a priority on the role of the local church so that in the end of the day what really matters in Anglicanism is the local parish and the local diocese. We aren't a global church which issues things down to you. We're a bottom-up church where we try, don't succeed, but we try to listen to the local church and build up our understanding from the bottom up. 